the hill as well. And so I gave him a talk about Benford's Law, whether he liked it or not, he couldn't really leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to move on to something else that was in the news, Enron. So we have Enron, Enron, the biggest fraud out uh, in recent memory, and Enron had numbers. <clears throat> you know a little bit about the story about Enron. Enron's corporate headquarters in Houston. There we go. You can see the first digit was a one. After that, things deteriorated rather fast. <laughs> These are our controller and treasurer. Very happy that they didn't know they were both going to jail. Uh, Andrew, the controller, not so happy. So let's have a look at Enron's numbers. The numbers that Enron filed, they filed real reports, real financial statements. It looked like this. They restated four years' worth of numbers. And so I haul out what we call the headline numbers, the numbers that are the most important ones that the financial press would camp on to. Total revenues, net income, and earnings per share. I remind you, honorable ladies and gentlemen, that this second digit zero is expected as a second digit 12% of the time. And it is usually some threshold. You go over a thousand or under a thousand, it usually indicates some threshold or other. So let's have a look at Enron's revenue numbers. 1997, these are ones, one of the ones that we stated, 20 billion point two. 1998, give a slightly messy number there. 1999, 40 billion point one. Just made 40 billion. And in the year 2000, just before it all came crashing down, 100 billion point seven. Net income, 105, 703, 1024. And Andrew, indeed, didn't let me down. In the year in which he gave me a rather messy revenue number, he didn't let me down because his earnings per share, one dollar and one cent. He just made a dollar. I like somebody that sets a goal and achieves it. <laughs> and he even went over slightly, so that wasn't a round dollar. So I was quite happy with him. So, of those 12 headline numbers, four, four and four, Seven of them have a second digit zero. And so you can actually calculate if something has a 12% chance of occurring, what is the chance in 12 rolls of the die that I will get seven of them? I will leave you to calculate it, but as our mathematicians here know, it is the binomial distribution which will give you that answer. And the probability is indeed very low. One more thing about Enron. Watch this revenue number. 40 billion, 100 billion. Enron's growth was $60 billion. In that time, $60 billion was equal to two Microsofts. In other words, Enron's growth was equal to two Microsofts. It is rather tricky to grow by two Microsofts. Microsoft was recently sued by the European Union. Microsoft is a type of company that gets sued by entire continents. <laughs> And when you get sued by entire continents at a time, you are rather large, and nobody's going to grow by two Microsofts in a year. Well, that's Enron. Let's have a look at uh, something else. And that got published, and I was happy with that. Streamflow data. So we have a bit of earth science. And streamflow in the United States, help me out, an important topic. <laughs> I would say so. An extremely important topic in the United States. Just one of the reasons why we care about streamflow is that if you build a bridge, you do need to know what the largest stream flow was that went past there in the past 50 years. Otherwise, you'll have line kill and bridge here and no line kill and bridge next year. So stream flow, very important. And what I found was a half a million records, stream flow statistics from the United States, covering 140 years. So the nice thing about this is that this data, the same technology has been used for the same 140 years to measure the same phenomenon. So we have no change in technology, we have a long time period, we have an important phenomenon. Stream flow statistics. This actually did get published in Mathematical Geology. I'm sure you subscribe, and it is indeed a page turn. I can't <laughs> wait for my next issue of Mathematical Geology to arrive. I really enjoy that journal. <laughs> uh, stream flow statistics, and there they come. And almost absolutely perfect fit to Benford's law. 
So this tells me that Earth science type data follows Bentford's law and follows it very closely, making Bentford's law perhaps something akin to a law of nature. The next data set that I looked at, one in which I could contrast, was lake data. So we had a quarter million lakes. There are about a quarter million lakes in the world. And we have one around the corner here, don't we? I think so. And uh, we have lake data. And so I looked at these lake statistics, and I thought, would this follow Bentford's law? Yes or no? The first thing I looked at was the perimeter of the lakes. Not working too well. And one of the things is, is that it might be difficult to define exactly what is a lake. We have things like slow moving lagoons, we have reservoirs, we have man-made lakes. Uh, you don't really know how big a lake is, it changes in size. And so this tells me that the size of a lake is somewhat problematic because we don't really know what a lake is or isn't. You know it when you see it. The surface area, another measure of measuring size, and indeed, what this graph is telling me is that there were many lakes with surface areas of 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 uh, square kilometers. And indeed, these were rounded numbers. They were getting an actual surface area, rounding it to the nearest tenth. And when you do all this rounding to the nearest tenth, the graph starts to at least tell you some kind of story. A little bit more, uh, once we got rid of the smaller lakes, which we didn't know whether they were lakes or not, things started approaching a power law distribution and the paper continues along that vein. One more thing.